the talk, as the title slide indicates, is all about what I consider to be canonical governance dilemmas that any DAO in organizing in pursuit of a complex purpose faces. So how did I get started even studying governance? So I advised constitutional reform processes and peace negotiations during law school and subsequently. So literally designing secondary rules, although mind you, it was typically advising different countries that were amending or rewriting their constitutions. And this meant I was effectively given considerable uh, it, it time and uh, actual compensation to think through some of the hardest challenges in human governance. Fast forward five years, and I start writing a paper that a lot of people were like, dude, what are you doing? This is the most esoteric set of topics imaginable, and you're trying to marry the two topics. What were those two topics? Constitutions and blockchains. So I fundamentally view a blockchain protocol as a constitution. I view it as effectively, ideally coordinating and constraining the incentives of a powerful group of individuals to act on behalf of a class of larger, broader participants. And so, no, I got started. I got a question in the chat. Did I get started early? No, just giving an introduction, um, starting right on the hour, um, which is as of uh, 10 o'clock, which I believe is the uh, start time for this talk. Um, so I'm getting, I'm getting some feedback saying, can we uh, rewind a bit and wait? For sure. I showed up 10 minutes early and there was no one here. So I just kicked off right on the hour, um, not knowing what I was supposed to be doing. So if RN Dow wants to do an intro, by all means. Yeah, thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Welcome to the presentation. Thank you very much, Eric, uh, for arriving and being on time and checking everything. Really appreciate you taking the initiative. Uh, while we wait for a couple more people to arrive, we can uh, do a couple of introductions. So I'm just going to launch it to a couple of you and then someone else, who, uh, whoever does the introduction, if you can pass it to someone else, if you want to share a little bit of what brings you here, why you're interested in Eric's presentation, uh, please share with us. Uh, Paul Breitner, uh, apologies if I mispronounce your name, will you give us a quick intro about yourself? Hi there, yes. Um, sorry, I don't have my video turned on at the moment, don't have it set up, but... I uh, am the head of policy and strategic advocacy at the Electric Coin Company, and uh, we are going through a uh, what we call a Z boot coming up soon at Electric Coin Company, looking at a lot of different things in the Zcash ecosystem that need to be ad addressed urgently, and one of them is governance. And I'm going to be spearheading that activity. So I saw saw this uh, discussion, thought it would be like right on point for me. So thanks for holding it. Fantastic. Could you pass to the next person, please? Just pick someone uh, at random and yeah. How about take that, it from Tom, Tom Dewhurst? So I just joined late, so I missed the brief. <laughs> yeah, intro. Just an intro while you're here. Hi. Uh, yeah. Well. Um, yeah. Great to be here, and thanks um, for the content. Um, yeah, I'm one of the founding members of Growth DAO. Uh, we're a a service based venture builder, um, helping Web3 startup scale. Um, so, yeah, operating a DAO, keen to learn more. And then the, the final point is hand off to someone uh, after you. Uh, sorry if I picked someone who's already gone, but um, Bear, that sounds like a cool name. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm a contributor um, in the token engineering commons. Uh, I focus a lot on the uh, kind of like more administrative side of things, including financial, HR stuff, uh, and also governance. <clears throat> so I'm like super interested in all of these uh, in all of these topics in relation with DAOs and how can we better organize ourselves in this type of uh, uh, compositions and organizations. So. Yeah, just really happy to to be here, uh, and I'll pass it on to um, to Paul Paul uh, Brigner. Yeah, I went, but um, why don't we go to uh, Pat Evanson? Hi, 
Hello, yeah, I'm a I'm an attorney from the United States focusing on corporate structure, uh, including uh, or Web three corporate structure rather, including DAOs. And wanted to hear. Uh, I've, I followed Eric's literature on the matter for a little bit. Saw this talk and was more interested. I can't see a list of participants, but uh, oh, there it is. Oh, uh, so actually, thank you very much. We're uh... Now uh, on time, we already had quite a few more people who arrived. So please, anyone else who would like to share a little bit about who you are and why you're here, uh, do so in the chat uh, in the meantime, so we can make the most out of the, the session. And since the majority of us are here now, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Eric. Thank you very much for being with us. Really appreciate your time, being really interested in your work and some of the dilemmas that you're talking about. So we're very excited to have you. Uh, over to you. Awesome. Um, and so how long should I talk for? How much do we want to leave for Q&A? Do we want Q&A in real time? What's uh, what's your preference? Re really uh, up to you. We're usually doing 30 minutes presentation, 30 minutes discussion after, but that's a very rough guideline and every awesome. conversation is different. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll aim for 30. If you have like a clarifying question where you're like, I can't understand the remaining sentences that are spewing from your mouth without you clarifying this particular topic. Feel free to just kind of, you know, raise your hand or shoot that in the chat, but sort of lengthy or substantive questions or comments, because a lot of you, it sounds like, have very interesting experience with DAOs directly. If they're more lengthy questions or comments, let's preserve that for the Q and A because I do have a decent amount of stuff I'm gonna try to rip through really quickly. And so, as I was alluding, I got my start advising uh, constitutional reform and peace negotiation processes. So, design of some of the most fundamental rules in existence. And a few years later, I started uh, studying blockchain networks and thinking, hey, there's something pretty novel going on here, which is that the rules or the protocol of a blockchain network can be understood as a sort of constitution itself in that it constrains and incentivizes the powerful network participants or validators to act on behalf of a broader class of users. To me, I'm like, sounds a whole heck of a lot like the constitutional design dilemmas that suffuse practice around the world. And so... To me, I'd like to start because governance is almost as overused of a word as democracy is. I like democracy, to be clear, but to me, often democracy means stuff I like in governance outcomes in particular. And so to me, I'm going to be using this definition, but I also welcome all manner of challenge because I like to I like to argue. Uh, so I have a legal background, a JD from the University of Chicago. So I'm pleased to see so many lawyers on the call in particular. We can riff on that margin to the extent it's productive. But my definition is rule based ordering of people and physical resources. Let me unpack that a little bit. So what are the rules that provide order that I consider to be fundamental to governance? Those are the softer rules that are much harder for someone who isn't a member of a community to identify. Those are norms and in their aggregate are often called culture. But there are also the formally articulated rules by a particular collective action authority the policies of a particular workplace, the laws and regulations of a particular country or subsidiary unit like a state, county, or a municipality. Those are institutions, formally devised rules. And so effectively, the rules that provide the order are the biggest buckets I place them in, norms and institutions. But what about order? What do we mean by what do we mean by order? To me, that's whatever is considered good by the majority of participants or the majority of decision makers, if it's not a particularly democratic unit, whatever is considered good in furtherance of why the organization was constituted in the first place. Presumably, disorder is bad. So unless a particular organization said, we 
are here to create chaos within this group itself. That's about the only sort of way I can think of breaking this particular parameter of my definition. So whatever you're trying to achieve, actions taken in furtherance of that are orderly. Actions taken against the animating purpose of a particular group are disorderly. And you might be like, what if the group doesn't fully agree about what is good? And I'd be good because you're foreseeing my public good slide itself, which is there isn't even clean agreement within a particular group about what is necessary in furtherance of a particular purpose at any given moment in time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What about the people? So you've got these rules that are ideally intended to provide order among a, a collection of people and physical resources. What people? Those are those subject to the rules, whether those rules are informally or formally enforced. Typically, these are members or citizens of a particular group or polity. The reason, though, that I emphasize those subject to the rules is immigrants who are here illegally in the United States are subject to our rules, even though they are not citizens. And so for me, many constituted orders that govern those subject to their enforcement authority are imposed upon people whether or not they're voting members of that particular group itself. Why not just resources, though? So I've got these rules that are ordering a group of people, and as importantly, a set of resources. Why not money? Why not financial instruments? Why not shares in a particular company? Because to me, those are themselves institutions. Allocations of resources like money, abstract unitized ownership shares, etc., these hinge integrally on institutional definition and enforcement. If I tell you I've got a really, really great investment opportunity in the United States or a really, really great investment opportunity in Zambia, which set of shares are you more confident in? This is not me arguing you should never invest in Zambia, but the way that they enforce claims over the future allocation of surplus resources from a particular project, from a particular collective action enterprise, are fundamentally less reliable, at least to people who don't live in Zambia and know the individuals enforcing those rules, those shares are fundamentally less reliable than countries that enforce rules impersonally. And so my contention is, is ultimately many of what are considered to be the most important property instruments in modernity are themselves a chosen specified set of rules within a given society. My property title and its transferability to anyone else is fundamentally a function of how rules are enforced in our society. And so for me, those types of property instruments are actually bundled up into the rules themselves. Those are formal institutions. So your formal institutions, alongside informal rules, such as norms and culture, combine in practice to provide order to a given set of people and physical resources that they command in furtherance of a particular agreed upon purpose. Every single slide almost, I will end with a TLDR for you because you'll probably come to realize I've got plenty of words. So the TLDR here is governance design is fundamentally, the design is fundamentally about formal rules. Choice in specific rules intended to coordinate people in furtherance of a given animating purpose. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Except there are ineluctable challenges that are present in all these contexts. So I spun up all my uh, slide art on mid-journey this morning. So if you have a question about why I chose a particular image, feel free to pull on that narrative because there is some design elements behind the apparent madness. The two that I'm not going to talk about at length today on this slide, which are essential ones, but I see all of these other questions as bundled into two 
fundamental buckets, which are themselves intertwined. That of the Constitution and that of constitutionalism. But ultimately, you need secondary rules in order to collect, act collectively at impersonal scale. That is a constitution. I view a corporate charter as a specific form of constitution. I view a blockchain protocol as a specific form of constitution, as well as the public documents that have been articulated for centuries now governing countries themselves. If you want to read more on this briefly, I wrote a piece with my colleagues at Block Science entitled, What Constitutes a Constitution? Easily discoverable, and it's actually a very approachable length in terms of the ubiquitous need for certain entrenched elements in governing human pursuit of complex outcomes. Many people, though, conflate constitutions with constitutionalism, which is effectively constraining and incentivizing the concentrated exercise of governance authority. That to me is a canonical challenge. And the problems that I detail today to me are quintessential elements in designing a constitution that actually productively constrains those who are empowered to act on behalf of the collective. And so to me, pure democracy in practice is exceedingly rare, rare and doesn't scale well. This is not me being opposed to democracy. I like decentralization and I like representatively democratic decisions. But not all democratic decisions are inherently desirable. Just because it's the express will of the majority doesn't make it good. The sort of the show pony example of this is Hitler was democratically elected. So the expression of democratic will isn't itself an intrinsic good unless it's constrained on certain margins itself. And so because pure democracy is rare and doesn't scale well, you tend to have concentrated exercise of governance authority. This means you've got representative losses in practice, as well as quintessential public choice dilemmas both of which I'll get into more. This is just my summary slide of, hey, if you haven't thought through these questions and you're designing an impersonal organization, you're probably doing it wrong. The next issue is that of imperfect foresight. Our inability to predict all downstream outcomes that'll be relevant for a particular group pursuing an animating purpose that about which there is sufficient agreement. Because our foresight is imperfect, this has deep implications for the design of governance processes themselves. Finally, do you think we would all agree about what is a desirable vision for society going forward? If each of us was dictator for a day, do you think we would make the exact same decisions? My contention is no. There actually isn't perfect agreement about how to proceed in any particular instance, and this makes the provision of public goods themselves subject to certain canonical challenges. So you've got your kind of classic smoke-filled room here in the image. To me, this is the issue. We elect politicians to represent our interests, but inherently, there's a question of how do you ensure that these individuals represents everyone's interests in their community. Guess what? What I just detailed is actually impossible because within any larger group, you have heterogeneity. That's one of the axioms that I use to kind of motivate a lot of my work. So heterogeneity means no decision that a particular individual makes on behalf of a larger collective will be to everyone's liking. And you're like, wait, 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 are you saying that never happens? No. To me, I'm like, when it happens, congrats on finding a unicorn. That's wonderful. Move on and allocate your scarce attention resources within governance to the decisions that matter, which are the ones about which there is fundamental disagreement within your group. And so for me, it's not to say that pure agreement about how to proceed never happens, but the more that that is true, the less you need your governance apparatus to resolve that question. I'll come back to that in a little bit. To me, there's just issues that 
any particular individual making decisions on behalf of a larger group, they're commensurating the incommensurable. What do I mean by that? Well, I was privy to some interesting discussions at Zoo Connect about where to hold the next Zuzalu location. Do you think there was total agreement about that? We pulled a globally disparate group of people together in Istanbul for a period for Zoo Connect and said, where should we hold the next Zuzalu? What do I posit? Those individuals we pulled together in Istanbul, they're heterogeneous. They have different preferences. Some people wanted Chiang Mai. Some people wanted Zanzibar. Others wanted different locations. I think for good faith reasons. These weren't people who were like, I'm going to benefit immensely financially if you come to this location and I'm going to laugh all the way to the bank. They had different beliefs, preferences, and interests, and that resulted in different outcomes that they preferred with respect to a singular decision. The next Zuzalu couldn't be held simultaneously in multiple locations without fragmenting a particular critical mass. So in some sense, making decisions on behalf of a larger group necessarily involves the person making the decision as commensurating incommensurables. How do you commensurate my preferences for Chiang Mai versus Xenophon's preferences, to give one example, for Zanzibar? How do you quantify those and say, these are right, these are more intense, these are preferable for these reasons? So when you're making decisions on behalf of a larger collective, you're trading off things that are very hard to quantify and say, this is the exact right decision. And the more you can say, this is the exact right decision, the less it's something that you need the governance regime to formally reify. So collective action at impersonal scale is necessarily lossy with respect to your personal preferences. Not everything you care about will be a priority, and even the issues you care about will not be decided upon in a way you agree with 100% of the time. This is the essence of acting collectively within large impersonal groups that accommodate sufficient heterogeneity. Again, what about the issues about which there is total agreement? These are not a major design issue by construction. You have to accommodate the ones about which there is significant heterogeneity of preferences within the group. So the TLDR here, the processes by which we collectively decide matter deeply for the incidence and magnitude of representative losses in practice. It gets worse, though which is to say I'll make a stylized dichotomy for any decision within a particular group. Heterogeneity doesn't just mean that collective decisions are hard and lossy with respect to any individual's preferences for how to proceed. There's a deeper problem. Posit two types for any decision. One that happens to have concentrated interests in that decision. Another that does it. They're like, honestly, on this decision, I truly don't care. My interests aren't implicated that strongly. Which individual is going to pay a lot more attention to that decision? Which individual is going to consume a lot of information about that decision? Which individual is going to show up even though participating in collective decision processes is itself costly? The one whose interests are implicated more strongly. So those with more intense preferences on a given issue will show up longer, spend more, obtain more information. This is classically called public choice. How do we result, how do we end up choosing the things we do as a public government is a way of understanding that particular frame. But other ways to describe this problem are called political economy, special interest politics, and rent seeking to give but a few of the ways in which this comes up over and over again in the study of human governance processes. Is this always bad? I'm not so sure, but it is fundamentally a major design issue. There's ways you can frame it that are really bad, but there's ways that you can also perceive it that to me are not necessarily as problematic per se. If I have perfectly neutral preferences on an issue and am forced to vote, 
is the decision more representative? Where I'm like coin flip, literally zero in terms of this decision, and voting is compulsory within the system. Shouldn't the people voting actually have an interest in the question being voted upon? But the problem is, is this is a structural constraint that governance regimes must countenance. Those with concentrated interests will be overrepresented in collective decisions by construction, mechanically. Another issue, that of unknown unknowns. This is nighty and uncertainty. We can't predict all of the things that will confront us. Here there be invisible dragons, as I like to state. We don't even know where they're lurking. We only know that something will emerge that we can't predict that we will have to resolve in the future. To give but one silly example, there are plenty of things I could do right now, next sentence, that might even cause the RN Dow folks to cut me off, to shut down the thing that you could not have predicted I would do last night. Don't worry, I'm not that crazy and I'm not going to go on that particular lark. There's a lot of people I respect in this particular audience. Those are the norms that govern us, even though there isn't a formal organizational shell that we've all contracted into in this particular context. But this inevitable specter of nighty and uncertainty has very weird implications for institutional foresight. We can't fully define in our formally chosen rules today that which we can't predict today. This is by construction. I presented this particular paper that this slide is based upon at the Ostrom workshop in September, entitled Norms, Institutions, and Digital Veils of Uncertainty. Nighty and uncertainty is a real beast for protocol designers. So what does this result in? Well, our enforcers in analog world, so to speak, have considerable discretion which is they decide in a given moment whether to pursue a violation of a given rule. If I'm speeding wildly because I'm drunk, or I'm speeding wildly because I'm taking my wife to the hospital because she's giving birth, trust that your enforcement officer, same violation, exact same location, exact same speed, your enforcement officer is probably more likely to exercise discretion in one case versus another. But do we like the discretion that enforcement officers exercise in modern societies, including the United States? I write about police unions and criminal justice reform such that, trust me, this is another example of you concentrate enforcement authority and you grant those enforcement officers discretion and you've got representative losses from that very concentrated exercise of governance authority itself. Nighty and uncertainty also means that collective decision-making is likely to be a permanently enshrined function, with all of the concentrated authority and special interest problems once more. And it means you'll probably need to change your governance processes themselves. Constitutional change. Constitutions that are sufficiently rigid or hard to amend are much less likely to endure in practice relative to ones that have a sufficient flexibility in amendment. TLDR here is this nighty and uncertainty. These unknown unknowns mean that collective decisions are ongoing and include an adjustment to the governance regime itself. Conflict is inevitable. To me, good governance processes avoid outright violent conflict. But people often mistake the unifying moment of constituting a DAO, of constituting an organization and saying, we're here to do this cool thing. We will never disagree with one another in the future because our agreement in this moment is so strong, is so high. I declare shenanigans. This piece is based on a piece in the MIT Computational Law Report entitled Governance as Conflict. The essence of governance is to deal with or accommodate conflict productively. The ongoing need to decide on behalf of a larger group plus heterogeneity of that group itself means each change, each decision going forward will implicate those heterogeneous members' interests differently. That means there will always be winners and losers to any particular change 
in the, in the system itself, as well as any decision about how to proceed given nighty and uncertainty. Some people will fight any change because of its effect on their interests or preferences relative to the status quo. What about those changes about which there is total agreement? Again, perfect agreement means the change will occur endogenously by construction, not something that your governance apparatus needs to deal with so much as the inevitable emergence of conflict within complex impersonal human associations. So the dynamic need to collectively decide and adjust these governance processes themselves means a system's resilience is closely tethered to its ability to accommodate conflict. Accommodate is a specific term of art that I use as a bucket to, to identify the three ways in which governance regimes productively accommodate conflict. They deter it to some extent, but some of it's inevitable. They mitigate the worst consequences of it so you don't get outright violent conflict, as shown in that mid-journey image to the right. And in certain ideal cases, it resolves the conflict altogether where both parties are happier. That is the rare case, though. Finally, for canonical challenges in governance, is that of public goods. Who do you think likes this bridge, this stylized bridge shown in this image? The people on the either side of that chasm. And I deliberately created this image in mid-journey because I got married in the Faroe Islands. And I drove in the world's longest undersea tunnel, connecting a group of 1,000 people to an island of about 25,000 people. And the cost of the longest undersea tunnel was paid for by the Danish government, of whom the Faroe Islands are a protectorate. Do you think that bridge made economic sense? That under, or, or undersea tunnel, I should say? Connecting 1,000 with 25,000 people, and we've got the world's engineering marvel of the longest undersea tunnel. How did that come out that way? Is that a public good? Do the Danish people, they're all like, yes, spend millions and millions of our taxpayer dollars connecting these two islands that we are far flung away from. So every decision about what is good for a particular group, there is likely to be disagreement about. Look at my last slide regarding conflict. So this is execution of the collectively decided decision. How do we spend this? This is public finance as it's often construed. Constraining and incentivizing those with the power of the purse is a quintessential problem in public and private governance design. Corporate governance itself is essentially aligning the interests of shareholders, owners of the actual capital, being assembled in furtherance of a particular revenue generating purpose that is pursued day in a day to day sense by managers. So in contexts where ownership and governance claims are abstract and unitized, and many DAOs fit this characteristic, many, if not most of the most important governance decisions are about how to expend resources and allocate revenue across time and across stakeholders. TLDR here, pursuit of the public good, and I put that in heavy quotations, do you think our defense spending in the United States is a public good? Do you think our welfare spending is a public good? And I chose those because they're natural call-outs to the two strongly held ideological preferences. Conservatives think defense is a public good. Progressives think welfare spending is a public good. Boy, they do not agree on that particular characterization, though. So pursuit of the public good involves expenditure of resources and allocation of benefits in nearly all impersonal governance contexts which makes governing the expenditure of shared resources itself a critical governance design question. So I've got two slides on DAOs that I'll rip through really quickly, and then we'll turn it open to discussion and questions. To me, at a high level, you can never fully automate away governance processes. Because of nighty and uncertainty and because of the inevitability of disagreement over how to proceed given the instantiation of nighty and uncertainty, you have to decide in real time. You can't predict what you can't predict by definition. Even DAOs that collectively decide via one person, one vote, some type of civil resistance or 
identity doxing or proof of humanity, or one token one vote, are unlikely to all be executing on a given collective decision, which means concentration of governance authority will still be occurring in the vast majority of DAOs. Attention costs, as well as heterogeneity of interest, means DAO decisions are not immune to public choice dilemmas along the lines of what I've already detailed. And DAOs alongside nighty and uncertainty means the need to decide is going to be ongoing. And the community will be the source of governance in truly uncertain periods because your formal institutions can't address that which by definition they couldn't foresee at the time they were devised. Disagreement shouldn't be considered to be anathema or in bad faith. It doesn't mean the system is broken. Instead, the governance regime will need a means of accommodating conflict in order to be perceived as legitimate and resilient. Finally, the design of public treasuries is subject to massive limitations. And anyone who's like retroactive public goods funding solves it all, or quadratic voting solves it all. And to be clear, I'm a fan of both of those models in limited contexts. But anyone who says those, it, those particular models of funding for allocating out of the public treasury and furtherance of a given public good, those have their own limitations. Every institutional design has a trade-off. None of them are panaceas. But I want to end on a positive note. All is not full of suck. And so the transparency of collective decisions that you tend to have in DAOs and that surrounding funding allocations is pretty unusual in comparative governance practice. There are very few places where the allocations of funds and who voted what on a particular public or on a particular collective decision is that transparent. That's pretty unusual. These are strengths that DAOs inherently should harness because they will lead to better governance in many contexts. Furthermore, many DAO communities, not all, are intrinsically motivated to have better governance. This means individuals are likely to show up and participate in ways that are not just due to a rational interest public choice calculus along the dismal lines that I've already laid out. Yet attention costs are still real. So my contention is, in many contexts, you're going to have this concentrated exercise of governance authority some people deciding on behalf of a much larger class of people. That's not an anathema, especially if such authority is checked and balanced. To me, this is a very fertile design space for experimentation. Two really cool examples we might get to in the Q&A is a data trust that I just helped constitute last year in the, it's a special purpose trust in Guernsey that represents interests of data contributors as against third parties that want to monetize their data. The first time I presented that to someone at a cocktail hour at Consensus in Austin, they were like, the trust is corrupting the data contributors because it centralizes authority. To me, I'm like, not all decentralization is always and everywhere good only when it's efficient in pursuing a particular collectively chosen purpose. The Q network, of which I am a root node, has a group of individuals called the root nodes who decide as a human body on certain decisions, such as slashing penalties, although they believe, and I agree, that the model can be expanded much further than that. Communitarian public goods funding tendencies are pretty impressive in these communities the sort of endogenous emergence of Gitcoin and other public goods funding mechanisms, to me, I'm like, that's a testament to there being strong community norms that are very positive surrounding DAOs. Those should be harnessed because those should mitigate some of the worst aspects of public finance problems. Furthermore, a lot of people can jump from DAO to DAO. They can just sell their tokens. They can rage quit, as it's called. This is a major constraint on the worst excesses that those with concentrated governance authority can exercise. So low exit costs are to me a good thing because if the governors know that, then they can't run away with the bags in real time because that just kills the entire project. 
Finally, structural change in the rules governing how we coordinate is a slow process. There were centuries in which limited liability corporations were only open to the hyper-wealthy and politically connected in a few sets of countries. And then in the 1800s, anyone could form a limited liability corporation, at least in the United States. And we are still ironing out the details in real time of the questions that acting impersonally at collective scale through a limited liability corporate vehicle entails for those subject to the decisions of a given corporation. Meaning, this is a slow process. So the fact that there aren't millions of vibrant DAOs out there isn't a condemnation of the potential organizational innovation here. Indeed, that potential is why I'm here talking to you and studying this stuff. Lot to throw at you, but that's all I got. Really amazing, really amazing, Eric. Thank you so much for that overview. And at the same time, going deep into or starting to scratch the surface rather of some of these very deep rabbit holes. And so I often slip in a word that's very important. That word is impersonal. And the corporate form is just one example of how we govern ourselves impersonally. My investments, I don't know the individuals that are pursuing revenue in exchange for my capital today. I trust the, I have confidence in, trust is inherently personal, Really good piece by uh, Morshid Manon, Primavera de Filippi, and I forget the third author, author, entitled Blockchain as a Confidence Machine. But the underlying point being, our incentives change drastically once our groups scale to a level that we don't know one another personally. This is often shorthanded as Dunbar's number. And there are interesting studies that are like put Dunbar's number at 150, another at 500. To me, I think it varies intensely as a function of the context in question, meaning if I live on an island and never see another person and that island has 450 people, over my life, I probably will come to know at a personal level all 450 people on that island. But if I'm a member of a tight-knit Orthodox Jewish community in New York City and I see millions of people in an average year, I think the number of people I can ever fully know to a personal level is actually probably lower. And so Dunbar's number is often critiqued because it's like, is it 150? Is it 500? We don't know. And therefore, it's too fuzzy of a concept. And to me, I'm like, is there an upper limit on the number of people you can know personally? If yes, then the concept has purchase in explaining the coordination of large human social groups because people's incentives flip pretty significantly when it comes to assuming the best or assuming the worst of somebody that they've never met before. We're naturally risk averse and if we don't know the individual and their interests or incentives appear to be at odds with ours, the risk averse assumption is to assume that they will act at odds with you. And so for me, the reason we have in institutions is that they emerge as a scalar mechanism in human social orders to accommodate conflict, to deter, to mitigate, and ideally, although rarely, fully resolve that conflict itself. That was the that was a very, I guess, not that short <laughs> summary of what we discussed in our breakout room. Any other uh, questions? Uh, I had a question. Oh, hello? Yeah, go ahead, Rahul. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, um, it, you know, I wanted to ask if delegation was kind of inevitable in large governance structures. And if so, what sort of things should uh, delegates do in order to improve their ability to represent their, their uh, constituency? So my view is delegation of some form is inevitable. Even if a DAO votes one token, one vote, or one person, one vote on a set of things, 
that the DAO needs. Then in public government contexts, they hand it over to a smaller group to execute. That's the executive branch in sort of classic tripartite government structures. But even if they're just paying a group to code something up for them that they will then implement as a patch or implement as a user interface. Again, they're delegating to a smaller set of individuals to execute on the given collective decision that is thought to be in furtherance of the public good in question or the collective will. To me, delegation, or as I call it, concentration of governance authority is to me inevitable. But that, that raises really critical concerns. To me, the ways in which you can constrain the exercise of delegates, they're considerable, but they probably are therefore likely need to be tailored to a given context and the specific authority that that delegate is exercising. What's the quintessential example of how you constrain a delegate? You subject them to periodic public elections. That's the politician model. Second, alongside that particular model, is that of acts of the legislature and the executive are subject to review by a distinct and independent authority. Again, in public governance context, that's just plain old judicial review. And so to me, one is monitoring their performance by an independent authority that can do something that the delegate doesn't like. The other is the delegate is relatively immune, although recall elections are another fashion that other than, hey, you only get elected every four years, well, if the public can at any time, if they call a recall election, then you know you should probably act a little bit more on behalf of at least 51% of the general public in exercising your concentrated governance authority. Granted, those are not, to me, sort of it, it brilliant solutions, but their ubiquity suggests that they might be the best we've got in many contexts. And so to me, the reason I keep saying context or tailoring is one of the sort of quintessential things we do as consultants at Block Science is we try to really understand what the community is trying to do and what they what what animates them. It all ladders back to animating purpose because that defines the decisions that will need to be made in furtherance of that purpose, the expenditure that will occur in furtherance of that purpose. And so for me, one sort of unpopular thing is I'm often telling people there are no silver bullets, there are no panaceas. I understand the menu of constitutional and political design options as well as private organizational design options, but it's only when kind of instilled at great length in discussions with the community itself that you might land on a particular design choice that's likely to ameliorate or mitigate a particular problem. I doubt it'll ever go away because of the inevitability of these dilemmas emergence in complex, impersonal human associations. Pat. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess it's a little related oh, i was most interested in your mention that there was it's your belief that there was i guess utility in having a low exit fee can you point us to some use cases in which there might be a tipping point or do you generally have a, a flat exit fee so great question and often for purposes of articulation in a condensed time period, I state things too definitely. I often sound like a heck of a lawyer when I'm speaking because I qualify the hell out of nearly every statement I make. So I don't believe in very many absolutes. And, and we so, appreciate that. And, and, and so my issue is all else equal, I think low exit costs can be a beneficial constraint. In the literature, this is known as a market 
for dictators. In a paper I've written pursuant to this topic, the title is Why Private Firms Aren't Democratic, But Some Public, for public Governments Are, arguing that there are a lot of efficiencies that come with centralized decision-making. But the more that the people exercising that centralized decision-making authority know that no one can leave and that everyone is subject to their governance authority, the more they become like classic dictators. They consume all of the excess revenue from everyone's activities, to put it in blunt economic terms. But the more that private firms know their CEO knows our employees can go work at a competing firm. Our customers can purchase from a competing firm. They are deeply constrained in terms of how unrepresentative of decisions they may call. But this is precisely why monopolies are not viewed exactly positively, including by many market advocates. Because the less competition that a firm faces in terms of those who can work for it, or in terms of those who can purchase from it, the more they're like, we're charging the revenue maximizing price, not the consumer welfare maximizing price. And so for me, exit costs, if they're sufficiently high, the people that are making decisions in the center know that no one can leave. Do they then make the best decision for the community in every instance relative to a context where people can leave? That being said, I don't want to paint exit costs as a panacea because there are no panaceas in the context we're describing. Because the double edge, the other edge to that particular sword is if exit costs are low enough, if you have a particularly high revenue period that people can just jump from, token price goes really high and everyone dumps their tokens, that can literally lead to the collapse of the enterprise itself. And so I think you hit the nail on the head by saying, what's the sweet spot? Presumably it isn't zero because if anyone can leave at any time, then effectively their incentives to build dynamically, to expend today in furtherance of a particular collective purpose, are actually weaker on important margins in many contexts. And so I don't think the optimum is zero. And frankly, that doesn't exist in practice. There is no organizational context in which you can exit to another viable organizational choice at zero cost. And I think that's a good thing. Where that sweet spot is, this is kind of a fudge, but it's consistent with the narrative I've laid out thus far. It depends fundamentally on what the organization is trying to pursue, what its animating purpose is. For some, and in highly financialized contexts, you probably want relatively low exit costs. But in others, if it's a much longer term vision, you want people to have skin in the game, but that probably means a well, well above non-zero exit costs. I hope that answered your question. All right. Well, thank you very much. We uh, have a few seconds left, but they're essentially run out of time. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it here as I, I have the, <laughs> I, the prediction that another question will push us way, way after. Um, Eric, how might we contact you or are you open to the yeah. audience who following work or having further questions, et cetera? What would Everyone, be good like, yeah, please reach out. I mean, I dork out about this stuff. I believe in the transformative potential of these new technological tools for more productively coordinating human beings voluntarily in pursuit of the many brilliant and diverse purposes that we put ourselves to. So like, People often hear my narrative and they're like, you think all of this sucks. And I'm like, no, all is not full of suck. But you just have to take into account a lot of these quintessential governance dilemmas. Otherwise, you'll just fall flat on your face. And so reach out, eric.alston at colorado.edu. I'm also on Twitter at incomplete rules. Um, so yeah, please, please stay in touch. Uh, this has been a lot of fun.
Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day, and we hope to see you at the next event. Take care.